Hey, welcome to another video. So today we're going to be going into the entire life of the gold Marduk. But before we begin, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, join the Sith Citadel Discord, link is in the description, and consider becoming a join member to support the channel. Anyway, let's jump straight into it. Once little more than an Ashrak, with a name lost to history while in the service of Ra, Marduk was once sent to kill Ashuli who was the Gould leader of Eridu, an area now known as Southern Iraq, and quickly rose to become one of Ra's greatest and most trusted lieutenants. It was because of this act that he took the name Marduk, meaning Bull of the Sun. He used this position to great effect when Tiamat launched a revolt against Ra, pledging to remove the Mad Queen if the system lords gave him free reign to do so and recognized him as one of their own. Although, some wanted him killed for presuming he could ask for this out of hand. Most agreed and hoped for his bloodthirsty nature to either succeed or cause him to die in the attempt. Either outcome would have been acceptable to them. Marduk soon took command of the entire combined fleets, once controlling over a dozen Hawtoks as well as countless other support vessels, and executed several attacks which drew Tiamat's forces into traps set in the key systems, destroying the stars of these systems, causing them to go supernova. Marduk's subjects managed to take most of Tiamat's forces out of their suicidal attacks. It was during this time that Marduk himself infiltrated Tiamat's court and engaged her in person while the space battles distracted her. Even without her space fleets and loyal Jaffa, Tiamat almost managed to kill Marduk, and he only managed to save himself by luring her into a trap, which he had prepared with the transportation rings. This trap literally cut Tiamat in half, leaving part of her in the temple with Marduk and the rest transported to her flagship in orbit. Celebrating his victory, Marduk performed an ancient ritual and expanded upon it by ritually preparing and eating the body of his fallen foe. It was through this that unexpectedly, he gained Tiamat's knowledge and memories through which he had learned of her plans to create an army of monster Gould, which she was going to use to replace the system lords. He promptly commanded several Nakwado laden motherships to plunge into the star which the planet orbited, causing a mini nova which immediately wiped out the small human population as well as Tiamat's orbiting facilities. What he did not know was that these monster Gould survived. The same memories led to Marduk going to Kinju, an Onus hosted Gould's son or consort to Tiamat, whom she had entrusted with her eye, a powerful artifact which later Anubis's mothership was powered by. Marduk managed to capture Kinju alive and presented him to the assembled system lords, sealing the pact which had them join him as one of the ranks and naming him Master of the Eye of Tiamat, as well as all Tiamat's former possessions. Marduk decapitated Nate Kinju before the other lord's very eyes. Starting his new empire, Marduk expanded his following through Queen Zapani, one of Tiamat's daughters who he had spared. In keeping with his high opinion of himself, he wanted nothing less than physical perfection for the hosts of his subordinates and was not above taking beings from even the lowest social stature to become hosts. Some symbiotes rejected their hosts, however, and were promptly killed and served to others as an example. If Marduk was to deal with these beings every day for eternity, then he demanded that they be beautiful and obey his every command. Because of this, Zarpani was kept busy creating replacements. The other system lords, although acknowledging their debt to him, did not truly welcome Marduk's rise to power. Marduk took over several of his neighbor's territories, acting as if he knew them personally. While any spies sent by rival Gould into his court revealed everything they knew to him rather than reporting back to their own masters. Continuing to use cannibalism and other tactics which shocked and inspired fear in both his subjects and his enemies, he accidentally united his enemies in their denisination of his barbism. Despite this, many of the weaker lords feared that they would have taken him down if they openly opposed him. 
Powerful lords such as Ra and Kronos blocked any attempts to rally support against him. For as long as he continued to be of use to them, and Marduk soon counted over a hundred gold kills, with even a few lords among them. At the height of his power, Marduk's planets included several Naquita mines, two entire shipyards, and even some trinium production facilities. Among these planets was Zegara, one of his treasury planets which contained large amounts of natural deposits of gold, Naquita, and the various crystals and gems which powered gold technology. His armies numbered in the hundreds of thousands, and only grew with each gold Marduk killed, absorbing their armies into his own. Marduk realized that his strength lay in the name which he had forged for himself, and so he often led his attack fleets personally in order to inspire awe in his allies and bring terror to his foes. He did, however, leave his entire forces to be utterly replaceable, and would often send many of his own ships to their deaths in order to achieve his objectives. After he had defeated the enemy, the resources and troops would be used to replace any that he had lost in those battles. Despite his total lack of compassion for his own troops, he would never overcommit them even in his days of madness, and was a shrewd general who picked his battles wisely, often attacking targets with lightning strike tactics, which would subdue the enemy immediately. These tactics worked especially well with primitive planets, which were only good for their human resources, where he could arrive, convert the people, and take whatever he needed with a minimum of fuss. Once he was successful, he would personally address the entire population through making extensive use of ring teleporters, which kept him from ever becoming a target for any length of time. However, brute strength would not always suffice to subdue an enemy, and Marduk knew this fact well. In these cases, he would use the ring transportation system to insert small amounts of his own troops into enemy key areas. This act often took years for him to build up a fifth column inside a foe of near equal stature to himself, such as when he defeated the Gould Sin and their entire Empire of the Moon, but would enable him to have forces in place so that the enemy would not know that a blow was coming until Marduk himself appeared through concealed rings to deliver the fatal stroke. Any warriors who joined his forces quickly got used to these tactics as he would often practice these lessons among them to instill loyalty. Even if this was not enough, his subjects were constantly reminded of all his past successes in glorious battle through an ingenious security system. Marduk's Peltax, engine rooms, and other vital areas of both his ships and temples were marked with cuneiform representations of his defeats of Tiamat, among others, which would have some small parts out of order. In order to gain access to these areas, his followers would have to learn the stories by heart, which SG-1 would later recognize as being Babylonian creation myths, and correctly identify these incorrect sequences to unlock the doors. Outside transport systems would also have a key in some form of these myths to activate receiving stations inside Marduk's strongholds. Occasionally, he would allow his enemies to live, but on the occasions that he did, the hunger to consume their memories within him grew and eventually became his primary focus. The flood of others' memories soon became a cacophony of voices within his head, and he started to kill not only his enemies, but those who had suited his increasingly bizarre whims. This caused his allies within the system lords to no longer have any reason to support him, and even his own priesthood began to bulk as any of them could be on his menu next. Seeking this opportunity, Marduk's son Bel encouraged a rebellion which Marduk's own people and even supplied them with a fitting punishment. Due to him being a cruel tyrant, eventually his own priests rebelled against him. He was locked in a sarcophagus on the planet P2X338 along with the Eye of Tiamat and a carnivorous creature that ate him alive only to be healed by the sarcophagus, which in turn started the whole process over again. He eventually escaped into the creature, however, and ate his former host. In 1999, Russian doctor of archaeology Alexander Britsky began an excavation in southern Iraq near Rafta, where he found several tablets engraved with Babylonian cuneiform symbols, and one with an unknown set of symbols later revealed to be a Stargate address. 
the coordinates for P2X338. Though the Russians did not have a Stargate at this time, they did have a DHD, which contained these symbols and so classified the entire dig, never allowing it to become public knowledge. When Russia set up their own Stargate program, Russian Army Intelligence gave secret orders to Major Valentine Kerensky to go to the planet and retrieve a magical device known as the Eye of Tiamat, along with Dr. Alexander Britsky. The team did in fact manage to find the Eye, along with Marduk's former host body in his sarcophagus, but at the same time freed the carnivorous creature, which Marduk had taken as its host. In the creature's body, Marduk was responsible for the deaths of the entire team, either for murdering them himself or causing them to use their cyanide pills to commit suicide, which left him without a viable host which he could use to escape the ziggurat. As he ate their dead bodies, he cocooned himself in the creature, biding his time. SG-1 later came to P2X338, discovering the ziggurat along with the empty packet of cigarettes left by the former Russian team. They went back to Earth and reported to Stargate Command, who discovered the facts surrounding the secret Russian team, which led to SG-1 being sent back to the planet, along with a further Russian team to assert the status of their comrades. Marduk again awoke when Colonel Alexei Zukov set off a booby trap, causing the entrance to the ziggurat to close. He attacked Lieutenant Tolonev in the body of the creature, poisoning her before he took Major Sergei Valerin as a host. In his new body, Marduk attempted to kill the other Earthlings in order to escape and once again take a place of power. Due to his host memory, he knew the Russian team's attempt to retrieve the Eye of Tiamat, and so attempted to retrieve it from the Russian commander, Zukov, before he killed him. Zukov seemed to be about to throw him the eye, but instead passed him a grenade, which had its pin pulled. This caused the entire room that they were in to collapse on itself, an event which Colonel Jack O'Neill witnessed, and so SG-1 presumed Marduk to have been killed. During this time, Dr. Jackson had managed to find some transportation rings, which he believed would take them to another temple a few miles away. Marduk had survived the grenade, only losing the arm which had held the grenade, and managed to free himself from the rubble in time to discover SG-1 just before they were about to ring out. Captain Samantha Carter used a remote to activate a pile of C4 along with some Russian explosives, and the group escaped through the rings. Marduk was thought killed when the explosive detonated, destroying the ziggurat and killing him. So what do you guys think of the entire life of Marduk? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you haven't already, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, join the Sith Citadel Discord, links in the description, and consider becoming a join member to support the channel if you so wish. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.